Hey everybody, welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ show. Today we have Claudia Black and we are talking about her book, Growing Up with Addiction as Youngsters, Adolescents, and Adults. So welcome, Claudia. Thank you. I love to talk about this topic because it affects so many people out there. So thank you for having me. Yeah. So um, tell me a little bit about what inspired you to write this book. Well, it's usually no surprise to people. We often write about something that we have some familiarity with. And you know, for myself, I grew up in a home where I had a father who was actually alcoholic. And I think what ultimately inspired me to write this book was the belief that nobody deserves to live with the kind of fear that you live with when you're raised with substance use disorders, that nobody deserves to live with the shame that we internalize about ourselves. And not only did I see that for children and uh, growing up in such families, but I think that's certainly true for the partner, the spouse, and it's just as true for the addict that, you know, everybody in this family is affected. And uh, I see the addict with such fear and shame, the partners with that fear and shame. And, um, and I just felt very strongly about that. Mm -hmm. And you know, I didn't sort of say to myself, well, I'm going to go out and write books about this or talk about this, but it evolved. And, uh, and I think that passion that uh, I feel all of these years later is still because um, people don't deserve to live like that and they don't have to live like that. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes we don't even know that we're living out a family legacy. So it will never happen to me is really about understanding that oftentimes we are living out a family legacy and, and it doesn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. When you say a family legacy, what I've, I've noticed is that it could be generational. It's not just the next generation. It could be several generations. And I know that you've done research. It's what do you usually find when people have addictions? It, you know, because some of it is genetic, right? One is that you're absolutely right. It's usually multi-generational. Some of it is genetic. And when it is, and only some of it's genetic. And, and when it's genetic, that doesn't mean it's a given that you're going to be you know, addicted yourself, but it means that you're going to be more prone to it. So typically there's a genetic predisposition coupled with some kind of psychological injury that sets a percentage of people who are children up. And it's about 25%, one out of every four children um, in an addicted family is more apt to become uh, addicted. But there is no other identifiable group more apt to become addicted than children of. But what you see happens generationally isn't just that the act of addiction repeats itself generationally, but the emotional uh, behavior that's a part of that addictive system repeats itself generationally. And then oftentimes that addiction will show back up as an answer to that emotional pain. Mm. So when I say repeats itself generationally, well, one is not only are you more prone to become addicted, you're also more prone to end up in a relationship with somebody who's addicted. So mm. you see that repeat itself. Mm. And then depending on the individual dynamics, because you know every family will have its own individuality in the context of addiction. If there's abuse, that often repeats itself. If there's rage, that repeats itself. If there's depression, that repeats itself. And then it doesn't take too long that, as I say, some kind of addiction is the answer for that. Mm, interesting. So um, I want to hear a little bit about, because you talked about that everyone is affected, right? The spouse is affected, the kids are affected, and the person, the addict, the addict is uh, affected as well. And you had said that fear and shame are the two probably primary, um, you didn't say this, but you mentioned fear and shame. Are those the primary emotions that people struggle with? They certainly are. And I do want to say something about shame, though. We think of shame as a feeling and as an emotion, but it's, I also see it even more so as a belief. It is the belief that who I am doesn't have value, that I'm not okay, that I'm not worthy. And taking on whatever the circumstances are that fuel that belief that I have about myself, I have a lot of feelings associated. I have maybe embarrassment, maybe humiliation, loneliness, sadness, fears, etc as I'm taking on that belief, but pretty soon I numb myself. And one of the characteristics of addiction is you learn how not to feel. You mm -hmm. disconnect emotionally. And I'm a believer that the more I come to know that shame-based belief about myself, the more disconnected I am from my feelings. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon I'm just acting out the belief and I'm pretty numb, I'm pretty frozen emotionally. 
Okay, so it all starts with the belief of who I am is not of value, which then creates a set of behaviors and yes. um, ways of coping, which may be yes. drinking, marijuana, I don't know, over the litany of different drugs out there yes. as a way to compensate. And is it fair to say like work? I mean, I've seen people be addicted to work, to email, to computer, you know, computer games, or is that a whole di different kind of category? Not necessarily a whole different category. And when we talk about the generational repeat that goes on, sometimes it's not the drug of choice that your parent had or your grandparent had. You might want to make so sure you don't end up like your mom or dad, that you end up addicted to gaming when they were end up addicted to drugs. You ended up addicted to gambling when they were addicted to alcohol. Um, and, and the addiction can really manifest itself in lots of different behaviors, and it provides the same thing. It provides an escape, a uh, form of anesthetizing, it relieves you for, in just this moment. Addictions are great fixes in the moment. It's in the long run that people get into trouble with them. Mm. But with shame-based belief, what happens is not just that it sets you up for other addictions yourself, but it also sets you up for victimization. It sets you up. If I don't believe I'm worthy, then I tolerate people's inappropriate behavior. So that can set me up for very unhealthy relationships in which I'm always in so this one down position. That shame-based belief can get in the way of my initiating. Um, you know, why even bother to try? Nothing I do makes sense anyway. And on the flip side of that, that shame-based behavior can set me up for perfectionism. And people will say, well, you know, I'm a perfectionist and I've done pretty well in my life as a consequence. But the problem with perfectionism is you're always seeking that approval to show that you are worthy. And it isn't about your performance because you've come to believe that nothing you ever do is good enough anyway. So you may perform really well, but the message you take with you is still not good enough. Mm -hmm. So today I see a lot of people in, in serious trouble with suicidal ideation, with depression, with self-harm, in spite of how perfectionistic they are, you know, which really says to a lot of people raised in addictive homes have an ability to look good to the outside world. Mm -hmm. And yet ultimately, so often there's going to be an inner despair and sometimes an inner just self-loathing. And that gets acted out. Mm, wow. Yeah, and how is this different then? I mean, I can relate to all the things that you just said. And I'm not necessarily, I didn't have parents who were addicted to alcohol, drugs, um, gambling, sex. You know, they, they didn't fall into any of those things. But I can see myself, uh, the whole Asian culture for me has been all about fear and shame that's kind of our operative <laughs> go-to yeah. go-to emotions so all of these things that you're mentioning perfectionism why bother trying boundary issues um you know belief of who i am is not a value those are really operative for me as well um so are these what's the unique Am I just unique or do other people no. kind of relate to some no. of these things? And what's the, what's the underlying? Other people often relate. Um, health in the family exists along a continuum and health within culture exists along a continuum. And I think that you come from a culture that's very rigid in structure, very rigid in expectation. And I think you get a lot of the same messages as a home in which there's addiction. Uh, the common denominator, one is, I learned a long time ago. First of all, I began talking about what goes on in an addictive home because people talked about dysfunctional families, but they ignored the elephant in the living room. The source often was addiction. So I felt very strongly I needed to sort of hang my hat to bring attention. So I talk about children of addiction all of the time, but you can generalize much of this to other types of troubled families is what I call that. Um, maybe where there's abuse, but no addiction, maybe where there's mental illness, but no addiction, but such as in your family, that's probably not characteristic either. Um, but you look at the phenomenon of what I call emotional abandonment. Mm. And that means to not be supported really in a healthy way um, emotionally. And 
the common denominator in, in your family compared to somebody where there's some more blatant dysfunction is loss. And there's a sense of emotional loss as you're growing up developmentally that's harder to identify for what it is mm. because it's, uh, it's it's sort of like being that looking good kid. You're being patted on the back for doing so well in spite of, but you're still internalizing who I am doesn't seem to be good enough. Nothing I do for these parents, nothing I do for this community, you know, allows me to feel good about who I am. And I defined emotional, I know I'm talking a lot here, but I defined emotional abandonment as I know I'm emotionally abandoned when I have to hide a part of who I am in order to be acceptable. Mm. And those parts of who I am in order to be acceptable that I have to hide are, maybe it wasn't okay for me to make a mistake. Somehow I learned I lacked in value if I did anything less than perfect. Mm. Maybe I learned that my feelings were not okay. Only certain feelings can be shown in this family and a whole array of others. Maybe I learned that my needs didn't have value, that somebody else's needs had more value than my own. So those are examples of abandonment. Another uh, example is unrealistic expectations, expecting the six-year-old to be as if they're 12, the 12-year-old to be as if they would have the resources of an adult. So that mm. is not as tangible and as visible, but it is as, because it's chronic, it's as serious. Mm. It's setting you up for identifying some of these issues. Right, so if you're emotionally abandoned of which Feel, or feel a sense of emotional abandonment of which we talked about all the different, you know, basically hide who you are. Others' needs have more value than yours, unrealistic expectation. These are kind of the contours of what it means to be emotionally abandoned. So you may be come from a culture, like an Asian culture, or a, what, you're, what I, I think your research has shown is that a lot of people with addictions have this emotional abandonment. So even though I don't have come from a family um, that has um, emotional abandonment, it's considered dysfunction or culture that is literally dysfunctional in terms of not being able to emotionally mature in, yes. in emotionally. Got it. That's actually so interesting. And I, <laughs> um, I want to talk to you more about that because it seems like we're – more and more society, I, I, the American culture seems kind of similar in the sense that a lot of kids are emotionally abandoned. And I don't know if that's just a gross generalization or if you think that that's what you've observed as well. Well, I think that one, let me tell you that I've done some work in, in, in Japan and I always have to be so mindful that what I'm talking about is contrary to what the culture supports Sports. And, you know, I, it, for me, every time I do a trip into another culture to do some speaking, I, I feel like I'm writing a whole nother book just to do a three hour presentation, just because I you want to be so mindful um, and, and also somewhat realistic about the kind of difference that you make. But back to here in the United States, I think that one of the dynamics that's uh, it's been happening over the last uh, couple of decades in particular is the busyness of our society. Mm. And also um, as a consequence of uh, both technology, but even transportation, we don't have the, uh, the positive impact of extended families that we once had. We don't have the positive impact of kids being raised in a sense of community, mm -hmm. um, which also offers a lot of support particularly in the context of if you have some impairment going on in that family system. And, uh, and today, I think that uh, the technology, you know, all the social medias is helping to create distance within even fairly healthy functioning families with the amount of time people are spending on screen. So I do think uh, as a culture, we're really creating a lot of impairment and dysfunction and then heaven help you add addiction on top of that mm. is exponential yeah on that happy note um <laughs> i was singing to people <laughs> no, I, I, I let us there <laughs> But I, what I want to do in the ne next segments, because I think it's really, I mean, part of what I think is helpful is to recognize that you're not alone and to recognize the various roles that you have as a spouse, 
as because you know you were talking about youngster adolescent or adult and the effects on them so what i wanted to do in the next segments is just talk a little bit about you know diving in a little bit more deeper about um, the shames the beliefs um, that people have um, and when they are either in a, a youngster or an adult um, or an adolescent whether you're the person who's addicted or married to someone who's addicted or um, um, the child of a person who has one of these addictions. So um, we've been talking to Claudia Black about her book, It Will Never Happen to Me, Growing Up with Addiction as Youngsters, Adolescents, and Adults. Thank you so much.